All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. Then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like a furnace, with a woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow. Then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fair round belly, with good capon lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances. And so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again toward childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound, last scene of all, that ends this strange eventful history, is second childishness and mere oblivion, sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. Shakespeare loving, ladies and gentlemen, Turks adore Shakespeare. We have translated him over and over again since the second half of the 19th century. By January 2003, the complete tragedies, comedies, histories, and sonnets have been translated into Turkish. No mean achievement. Not all languages are that fortunate. And our theaters have presented countless productions. Shakespeare is Turkey's most beloved playwright. Courses in Shakespeare are staples in the curricula of most of our major universities. It is our great pleasure and pride to present this lo lovely gathering uh, to this audience of the superb Turkish Cultural Foundation, headed by Professor Nurhan Atasoy, my old friend. She is young, much younger than I am. <laughs> we have been friends for a very long time. Uh, this program is entitled Turkish Shakespeare. Uh, well, Shakespeare Turkish, because uh, with this uh, program uh, presents Shakespeare to you as a Turkish playwright and poet. Mm -hmm. He has been so popular, so immensely influential in the theatrical world and in the literary world of this country. Uh, it is a script that I wrote and compiled. It is our tribute to the beloved Turkish British playwright and poet. I hope that this distinguished audience will enjoy it as a dramatic and poetic experience. Shakespeare looms large in the Turkish theater. We revel in his heroes and clowns. His tragedies and comedies with their compelling universal verities have fascinated us Turks for a century and a half. His heroes are ours too. I think the king is but a man, as I am. The violet smells to him as it doth to me. All his senses have but human conditions. His ceremonies laid by, in his nakedness he appears but a man. And though his affections are higher mounted than ours, yet when they stoop, they stoop with like wing. We Turks share Othello's jealousy, Hamlet's hesitations, Macbeth's ambition, and Lady Macbeth's greed for power. Shakespeare's heroes are hardly ever great <coughs> men. Many are brave. Some exercise sovereign power. Among them, we find several who have triumphed in battle. Yet, they all fall from the heights of success or hope into defeat and death. But Malvorius says in Twelfth Night is so right. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness trust upon them. Shakespeare has reminded us powerfully that ambition often leads to <coughs> devastation for leaders and nations and his warning about the ultimate victory of the reversals of fortune, of ingratitude. The painful warrior famous for a fight, after a thousand victories once foiled, is from the book of honor raised quite, and all the rest forgot for which he toiled. Perhaps the real hero is the protagonist who can show courage in the face of death. Julius Caesar articulates this. 
cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. Of all the wonders that I yet have heard, it seems to me most strange that men should fear, seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. And what about clowns, the other side of our fate? Smiles versus tears, laughter side by side with misfortune. In his old age, Lear has been abandoned, betrayed by two of his daughters, by others close to him, by people for whom he had done favors through the years. But his clown has remained loyal, right beside him, a friend indeed. When he sees his daughter <coughs> sulking again, Lear asks, How now, daughter? What makes that front to dawn? He thinks you are too much related to the frown. Lear's clown breaks in, chiding the old king. Thou wast a pretty fellow when thou hadst no need to care for her frowning. Now thou art a zero without a figure. I am better than thou art now. I am a fool. Thou art nothing. <laughs> <laughs> he that keeps nor crust nor crumb, weary of all, shall want some. That's a shield peace god. The hedge sparrow fed the cuckoo so long that it had its head bit off by its young. Lear is confused, disoriented. Doth any here know me? Why, this is not Lear. Doth Lear walk thus? Speak thus? Where are his eyes? Either his notion weakens, or his discernings are lethargy. How, ah, walking? Tis not so. Who is it that can tell me who I am? The clown taunts old Lear with puzzles. Thou canst tell why one's nose stands in the middle on space. Don't. Why to keep one's eyes on either side's nose, that what a man cannot smell out, he can spy into. <laughs> <laughs> canst tell how an oyster makes his shell? No. <laughs> Nor I neither. <laughs> but I can tell why a snail has a house. Why? Why to put his head in, not to give it away to his daughters and leave his horns without a case. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why the seven stars are no more than seven is a pretty reason. Because they are not eight? Yes, indeed. Thou wouldst make a good fool. <laughs> If thou wert my fool, uncle, I'd have thee beaten for being old before thy time. How's that? Thou shouldst have been old till thou hadst been wise. King Lear, betrayed by two of his daughters, is caught in a storm in the woods together with his clown. Blow, winds, and crack your cheeks. Rage, blow, you cataracts and hurricanes. Spout till you have drenched our steeples, drowned the cocks. Rumble thy bellyful, spit fire, spout rain, nor rain, wind, thunder, fire are my daughters. I tax not you, elements, with unkindness. I never gave you kingdom, called you children. You owe me no subscription. Then let fall your horrible pleasure. Here I stand, <coughs> your slave, a poor, infirm, weak, and despised old man. Lear is in the grip of senility and insanity. The Duke of Gloucester recognizes Lear's voice from afar. The trick of that voice I do remember well. It's not the king. And the old pitiable king responds. I ever inch a king, <coughs> when I do stir, see how the subject quakes. His third daughter, Cordelia, to whom Lear had been unfair, has found her father. She is fighting against the others together with Lear supporters, but they lose the battle. <coughs> Lear and Cordelia are captured. At that tragic moment, Lear says to Cordelia, No, no, no, no. Come, let's away to prison. We two alone will sing like birds of the cage. When thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. So we'll live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and hear poor rogues talk of court news and we'll talk with them too, who loses and who wins, who's in, who's out, and take upon us the mystery of things as if we were God's spies and we'll wear out in a walled prison, <coughs> packs and sects of great ones that ebb and flow by the moon. Their enemies hang Cordelia. Lear enters, carrying her corpse. She is gone forever. I know that one is dead and one, one lives. She is dead as earth. 
Lampian looking glass, if that her breath will mist or stain the stone, why then she lives. And the once mighty Lear dies mourning for her. No, no, no life. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life? And thou, no breath at all. Thou'lt come no more. Never, never, never, never, never. Globe was the name of Shakespeare's theater, significantly, because Shakespeare created the world on the stage, and there is global respect and fondness for Shakespeare. But he had his distracted detractors, too. Remember Voltaire dubbed him barbaric, and added, His works are like a garbage dump. <laughs> to find one grain, you have to dig deep, digging into it. <laughs> Samuel Pepys denigrated Romeo and Juliet. I have never seen a worse play. <laughs> and George Bernard Shaw said, if I could, I would take him out of his grave and stone him. <laughs> but Shaw was also wise enough to add, I pity those who take no pleasure in Shakespeare. He outlived thousands of creative artists. He will outlive thousands more. Don't be surprised about my modesty. Not even I can write better plays than his. <laughs> in the Turkish experience, Shakespeare has grown in respect and admiration since the earliest productions in the, in the 1840s. The first performances took place in 1842 in Istanbul's Concordia Theatre, but not in the Turkish language. In 1885, the first printed Turkish translation, Merchant of Venice. Shakespeare's major tragedies were staged by the <coughs> enterprising Armenian director, Güllü Agop. Another Armenian theatrical personality, Bedro Satamyan, gained renown as Hamlet. He was so conscientious that to gain insights into Hamlet, he went from Istanbul to Elsinore. To study Othello, he traveled to Venice and Cyprus. To learn about Romeo, he went to Verona. Turkey's first woman Hamlet was also an Armenian, Miss Siranush Nigosyan. Decades later, two Muslim actresses appeared in the role of Hamlet. Once in a late 19th century production of Macbeth, a funny thing happened. The Armenian actor Gülü Agop was in the role of Macbeth. In one scene, he got carried away and took a few steps upstage. The musicians thought he wanted to do a musical number and started to play a vibrant polka. <laughs> Macbeth is notorious for many funny incidents. Believe it or not, the great cowboy John Wayne, some of you remember him as a famous movie star, John Wayne once wanted to appear as Macbeth for some of you. From the moment he stepped on the stage, the audience kept giggling. A while later, he couldn't stand it anymore. He walked upstage, shrugged his shoulders, and blurted out, Hell, I didn't write this crap. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Burton, too, did Macbeth. For the battle scenes, he wore an armor. Uh, he had to pee. He couldn't hold it in and uh, passed water into the armor. The cast and the entire audience heard the noise of running water and everyone broke out into laughter. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a hilarious episode from a Macbeth production in Istanbul. I saw this one, so I can vouch for it. I, I assure you, it happened this way, exactly this way. In 1962, in the summer of 62, there was a major production in the open-air rotunda of the mid-15th century fortress, Rumeni, son of the Bosphorus, as most of you know. The site is majestic, and the space used for the performance is quite expansive. The director, understandably, wanted scores, hundreds of extras, especially for the battle scenes. But where were they going to find so many extras? Somebody had a bright idea. Why not the nearby 66th Battalion? They managed to obtain the approval of the military authorities. 400 soldiers came to the fortress the evening of the premiere. The director said to the major, their commanding officer, we'll give your men sackcloth costumes and wooden shields and swords. They'll be lined up, waiting to run down the slopes. When the time comes, I'll give you a flying cue. You'll command them to run down and confront each other at the rotunda below. They'll engage in mock battle, but please tell them to run down vigorously and fight dynamically. The commanding officer tells his men all about this. Late in the evening, Macbeth starts. 
Turkish soldiers are all lined up up there. <laughs> Act 5, Scotland, Macbeth's men and Macduff's soldiers will fight. The director sends his flying cue to the major, and the major gives his orders to the soldiers. All right, men, do your best. Run down there and fight. 400 eager Turkish soldiers start, start running down the slopes with their traditional Turkish Islamic battle cry. Allah Allah! <laughs> Shakespeare. <laughs> they say Hamlet is in the heart of every actor. By the same token, Shakespeare is in every Turk's heart. Ladies and gentlemen, I have tried to express this fact, Shakespeare's popularity, in a doggerel of my own. The Bard is the playwright for Turks of all ages. In Turkey, all the world's a stage on all stages. Our lullabies are from the folio pages. Desdemona's Willow Song, Macbeth's Rampages, Mesmerize Our Babes in the Woods, and Our Sages. To Corneille, Racine, no place, we might say niet, but we love and mourn Romeo and Juliet. As soon as Richard III's evil starts to lurk, our emotions stir, our eyes pop out, our ears perk. With our countless full dress productions of Hamlet, we have a princely boom or a royal boom left. He fought against Turks, but we adore Othello. He lets out a bellow, and our braves turn yellow. Queen Elizabeth <laughs> is Liz Taylor to some Turks, yet Shakespeare's scholarship is one of our great quirks. To us, the music from the spheres is from Twelfth Night. We eat the stuff dreams are made on. Turkish delight. <laughs> People claim Turks are macho, but Lady Macbeth scares patriotic, patriarchal Turks to death. It belongs to us Turks, that scepter dial of John Bull. Stratford on Avon is as dear to us as Istanbul. We're involved. Lear can blame us, Richard can maim us, Iago can defame us, Bishu can tame us. <laughs> Shakespeare, like Ataturk, condemned those who made spears. They both sang loving praises of those who break spears. Our nation is Ataturk's, but also Shakespeare's. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, is this a mutual feeling? Does Shakespeare hold good thoughts or at least neutral feelings about Turks? Or is the Turkish love for Shakespeare unrequited? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we think he is great, but he is an ingrate. <laughs> he makes about 35 references to us Turks. Not one is complimentary. Sometimes he uses dreadful or disparaging adjectives, lustful, well, maybe that's not bad after all. <laughs> but barbarous, infidel, cruel, malignant. Yeah. Othello boasts, I took by the throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus. Iago too scandalizes us. Nay, it is true, or else I am a Turk. <laughs> Before he becomes King Richard III, Duke of Gloucester says, What? Think you we are Turks or infidels? <laughs> Perhaps our only consolation is that the Bard has many of his characters say nasty things about other nations and ethnic groups as well. In Ottoman productions, they used to expunge the negative references to Turks. But they also went beyond that. Sometimes the Merchant of Venice was censored on the grounds that it might offend the feelings of the Jewish minority. Among Shakespeare's bits of wisdom are, of course, the advice Polonius babbles to Laertes. Theater goers in Turkey relish all this, and even pay heed. Give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought in this is act. Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. The friends thou hast, and their adoption tried, crackle them to thy soul with hoops of steel. But do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new hatched, unfledged comrade. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in buried, that the opposed may beware of thee. Give every man thine ear, but few thy voice. Take each man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. Costly thy habit as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy, rich, not gaudy. For the apparel oft proclaims the man. 
neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. This, above all, to thine own self be true, and must follow as the night of the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Shakespeare, often an advocate of justice, virtue, love, and courage, makes his protagonists stand up to defend the cause of those who are oppressed or suppressed, among them women. Frailty, thy name is woman. Yeah. Ignore that. <laughs> Many of Shakespeare's heroines are powerful, even formidable. Listen to Iago's wife, Emilia. But I do think it is their husbands' faults if wives do fall. Say that they slack their duties, or pour our treasures into foreign laps, or else break out in peevish jealousies, throwing restraint upon us, or say they strike us, or scant our former having in despite. Why, we have galls, and though we have some grace, yet have we some revenge. Let husbands know their wives have sense like them. They see and smell and have their palates both for sweet and sour as husbands have. What is it that they do when they change us for others? Is it sport? I think it is. <laughs> and doth affection breed it? I think it doth. Is it frailty that thus errs? I think it's so. And have we not affections, desires for sport and frailty as men have? Then let them use us well, else let them know the ills we do, their ills instruct us so. <laughs> Psalm 66 is virtually a household poem in Turkey, thanks to a wondrous, if unfaithful, version by a rather eccentric translator and powerful satirist, the late John Eugen. Tired with all these, for restful death I cry, as to behold desert a beggar boy, <coughs> and needy nothing trimmed in jollity, and purest faith unhappily forsworn, and gilded honor shamefully displaced, and maiden virtue rudely strumpeted, and right perfection wrongfully disgraced, and strength by limping sway disabled, and art made tongue-tied by authority, and folly doctor-like controlling skill, and simple truth miscalled simplicity, and captive good attending captain ill. Tired with all these, from these I would be gone, save that to die, I leave my love alone. Sevgili izleyiciler, bu sorunun kendi yaptığım sevgim büyüktür. Ama bu çeviri Shakespeare'e biraz sadık diye düşünüyorum. Onu kendi çevirinden Türkçe olarak okuyacağım size. Bıktım artık dünyadan. Var ölüp kurtulsam. Bakın gönlük aniler sokakta dileniyor. İşte kırtipillerde bir süs, bir giyim kuşam, işte en temiz inanç, kalleşçe çiğneniyor. İşte utanmazlıkla post kalkmış, yaldızlı şan, işte zorla satmışlar kız olan kız namusu, işte gadra uğradı dört başı mağmur olan, işte kuvvet kör topal, devrilmiş boyu bosu, işte zorba sanatın ağzına tıkaç tıkmış, işte hüküm sürüyor çılgınlık bilgiçlikle, işte en saf gerçeğin adı saflığa çıkmış, işte kötü bey olmuş, iyi kötüye köle. Bıktım artık dünyadan, ben kalıcı değilim. Gel gör ki ölüp gitsem yalnız kalır sevgi. In the Tempest, Gonzalo dreams of creating a new type of society on his desert island. As he waxes poetic about his utopia, two noblemen interrupt to mock him. I don't have a plantation on this island, my lord. And were the king armed, what would I do? It's the commonwealth I would by contraries execute all things. For no kind of traffic would I admit, no name of magistrate. Letters should not be known. Riches, poverty, and use of service, none. Contract, succession, born, bound to land, tilth, veneer, none. No use of metal, corn, or wine, or oil. No occupation. All men idle, all, and women too, but innocent and pure, no sovereignty. Yet he would be king aunt. The latter end of his commonwealth forgets the beginning. All things in common nature should produce without sweat or endeavor. 
treason, felony, sword, pike, knife, gun, or need of any engine would I not have. But nature should bring forth of its own kind all poison, all abundance to feed my innocent people. No marrying among his subjects? None, ma'am. All idle whores and knaves. I would with such perfection govern, sir, to excel the golden age. Save his majesty. Long live Gonzalo. Hamlet, as everywhere else, is the jewel in Turkey's Shakespearean crown. In the past 95 years, there have been 20 full dress productions, and in 2004, even a ballet version entitled Naked Hamlet. <laughs> Nine different Hamlet translations have been published in book form. When Istanbul's venerable city theater did its first Hamlet in 1914, there were seven men in the audience, one of them the hapless chauffeur of a rich spectator. <laughs> Less than 50 years later, at the same theater, Engin Cezar gave 170 consecutive performances. A total of 70,000 people watched his energetic Hamlet. 170 consecutive performances became a world record, which was broken six or seven years later by Richard Burton on Broadway. In this country, people from all walks of life enjoy Shakespeare. In Istanbul, there was a, the captain of a police precinct right here, who was a great Shakespeare fan. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, there is an old story. In 1936, Tatar Refi, a two-bit actor with a touring company, was doing his six-week military service in a rural town in Anatolia. When he returned home, a friend asked, how was military service, Refik? What did you do? Refik grinned, I did Shakespeare for six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Astonished, his friend asked, how come in the army? Refik told his story. Our colonel was a Shakespeare enthusiast. When he found out I was an actor, he made me do Othello twice and Hamlet once in 45 days. Now, who am I to play Othello, or especially Hamlet? But you have to obey orders. Aye, aye, sir. So I did Othello and Hamlet. To be or not to be? That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them. To die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep, to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream, ay, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietest make with a bare bodkin? Who would these fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. Our city theater of Istanbul had a marvelous tradition in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s of opening each season with a new Shakespeare production. This became for young and old Istanbul residents a brave new education in Shakespeare and the theater. It was started by the great mentor of modern theater in Turkey, Muhsin Ertuğrul, who was a distinguished <clears throat> Shakespearean actor and director. He and his colleagues did not have it easy. Some of the leading critics were writing in the 1930s, even if playwrights like Ibsen, Schiller, and Shakespeare are geniuses, or more powerful than geniuses, even if they are world-renowned, they are detrimental to our theater at this juncture. They are destroying our nation's refined taste. <laughs> Shakespeare pioneers in this country had to brave so much. They had to be ingenious and innovative. Sadi Tech was a popular actor who headed a touring company. 
1946, I attended Sadi Tech's production of Hamlet on the Asian side of Istanbul at the Kadıköy Halkevi. Before the curtain was raised, Sadi Tech came forward and addressed the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, my fellow actors who play Horatio and the Ghost are unable to appear tonight due to illness. <laughs> Obviously, Tech, who was not able to pay their salaries, so they were refusing to take the stage. So the veteran actor announced, with your permission, besides Hamlet, I shall play Horatio and the Ghost as well. <laughs> the curtain went up. Act one, scene five. All three are on the stage. Sadi takes speaks Hamlet's lines, runs out, wraps himself up in a sheet, and runs back into the stage as ghost. Exits as ghost, comes back as Horatio, in and out as Hamlet, ghost, Horatio. At that time, Take is past 50, already slightly old for Hamlet and Horatio. Also, he's on the fat side. He keeps running, running out of breath, panting, his tongue hanging out. Despite all this, he manages to do his triple threat, which was a historic first. But there is more to this. 25 years later, I was serving as this country's Minister of Culture. One day, my undersecretary said, Sadi Tech would like an appointment. <laughs> By all means, I said, I'd love to see him. He came, he was now, now close to 80, but very sprightly. Halfway into the conversation, I said to him, I wonder if you remember the occasion. 25 years ago, you had done three roles in Hamlet, even in the same scene. He paused for a moment, but it was even more interesting the following night, he said. Horatio and the ghost didn't show up. Also, the queen and Ophelia. <laughs> Gentlemen, theater people like Saadi Tech could have done Hamlet or any other Shakespeare play single handedly if they had to. Shakespeare not only served world theater splendidly, but English poetry as well. Yeah. The sonnets are truly exquisite. Being a lyrical language, Turkish accommodates the power and flow of the sonnets. Here is Sonnet 55. Not marble nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this powerful rhyme. But you shall shine more bright in these contents than unswept stone besmeared with sluttish time. When wasteful war shall statues overturn and broils root out work of masonry, nor Mars his sword, nor war's quick fire shall burn the living record of your memory. Against death and all oblivious enmity, shall you pace forth. Your praise shall still find room, even in the eyes of all posterity, that wear this world out to the ending doom. So till the judgment that yourself arise, you live in this and dwell in the lover's eyes. Now listen to the same song, 55 in Turkish, again my translation. Ne aldızlı hükümdar anıtları, Ne mermer, ömür süremez benim güçlü şiirim kadar. Seni pasaklı zaman pis bir mezara gömer. Ama satırlarımda güzelliğin ışıldar. Savaşlar tepe takla devirir heykelleri. Çökertir boğuşanlar, yapı demez, sur demez. Ama Mars'ın kılıcı, Cengin ateş selleri, Şiirimde yaşayan anını yok edemez. Ölüme ve her şeyi unutturan düşmana karşı koyacaksın sen. Yeryüzünü mahşere yaklaştıran çağların gözünde bile sana bir yer var. Övgüm seni çıkarttıkça göklere. Dirilip kalkıncaya kadar mahşer gününde yaşarsın şiirimle sevenlerin gönlünde. Such is the euphony, the music of the sonnets. Poetry is melody. Music is paramount in Shakespeare. That plays a major role in the way us Turks are enamored of the bar. The man that hath no music in himself, nor is not moved with concord of sweet sounds, is fit for treasons, stratagems, and spoils. The motions of his spirit are dull as night. Richard III, of course, is such a man, an adult, an unadulterated villain. He annihilates countless human beings. Near the end of the tragedy, he has become afraid of himself. What do I fear? Myself? This 
not as spy. Richard loves Richard. That is, I am I. Is there a murderer here? No. Yes, I am. Then fly. What? For myself? It's as if there's a stirring in Richard's conscience. Does a monster like him possess a conscience? He denies and defies it as a sickness. Let not our babbling dreams affront our souls. Conscience is but a word that cowards use, devised at first to keep the strong in awe. Our strong arms be our conscience, swords our law. Finally, Richard III desperately decides to flee and shouts, A horse! A horse! My kingdom for a horse! There's a funny story about this. In the 19th century, the Irish actor Barry Sullivan was a well-known Richard. When he was screaming, A horse! A horse! A man in the audience shouted back, We have no horse! Will you take a donkey? <laughs> Barry retorted, Yes! Certainly. Why don't you step upon the stage? <laughs> Pity we know so little about Shakespeare's life, or even exactly who he was. Shakespeare's scholarship is virtually an industry with thousands of studies published in scores of languages. The Shakespeare identity crisis is truly spectacular. So many claims and arguments have been and are still being advanced. One of the earliest insists that the real author was the renowned philosopher, essayist, and statesman Sir Francis Bacon. Another argues that the distinguished playwright Christopher Marlowe wrote all the plays and the songs. Another speculation holds that Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, used the pen name of Shakespeare. Maybe, says another, the Earl of Rutland used the code name of Shakespeare, or the real bard was an Irishman called Patrick O'Toole. <laughs> Even Muammar Gaddafi once argued that Shakespeare was an Arab sheik from Libya. <laughs> and his name was Sheikh al Zubair. <laughs> In 2003, at a Shakespeare and Islam symposium held at the Globe Theatre, the well known scholar of Islamic mysticism, Professor Martin Lings, claimed that Shakespeare was probably a Muslim Sufi leader. <laughs> According to an Indian theory, his original name was Pir Prickly Pear. <laughs> the great film director Peter Brook heard from an Uzbek that the derivation of the name is Shakespeare. Uh, there is also the claim that uh, Shakespeare is simply the English translation of the Italian name Crolelanza. <laughs> Some individuals have actually spent or <coughs> wasted a whole <laughs> lifetime to prove that the bard was this or that person rather than the actor named William Shakespeare. There have even been those who dug up the grave of some person or other. Speaking of grave digging, uh, one recalls a witty anecdote by W.S. Gilbert, a famous 19th century British actor. Gilbert always denigrated the renowned Shakespearean actor Sir, Sir Herbert Birbaum, Birbaum, sorry, Tree. Once he quipped, do you know the best way to solve the Shakespeare Bacon controversy? Open up their tombs and take the two coffins out. Bring Sir Herbert Birbaum Tree there to play Hamlet. Whichever dead man becomes enraged and kicks up a storm in his coffin, that is the real Shakespeare. <laughs> I'm not sure if who Shakespeare was is a matter of life and death. Does it matter who Homer was? Turkey's great mystic Yunus Emre, who composed magnificent humanistic and humanitarian poems in the late 13th and early 14th century, is unknown and, and undocumented as to his life. So long as the plays and the poems exist and endure, what does it matter if it's Shakespeare or Bacon or Earl of Oxford? <laughs> The tribute suffices. How wonderful is the call of admiration by Ben Jonson. Soul of the age, the applause, delight, and wonder of our stage. Rise, my Shakespeare. Ben Jonson also predicted that Shakespeare was not of an age, but for all time. Certainly for us Turks, for our age here. We have pronounced his name as Shakespeare, <laughs> or Shakespeare, <laughs> or Shakespeare and always revered him. Othello, for us, was compelling. Traveling troops and circuses presented it as black man's revenge. 
surfaces did abbreviated and altered versions of it, following the tightrope walking act, <laughs> a fearsome Othello, face blackened with charcoal, used to come out gesticulating wildly, speaking his lines in a deep declamatory style, and grandiloquently preying on the audience's emotions. Iago would get booed and cursed vehemently. <laughs> Old ladies used to call out to Desdemona, you poor little thing, they're slandering you. <laughs> and as Desdemona and Othello were dying, most adults would weep profusely. Children would scamper about in fear. Circuses and touring companies gave countless Othello performances at hundreds of locations through many decades all over Turkey. In view of that fact, it is safe to assert that Othello stands as the most performed play ever in Turkey's history of the theater. Many actors achieved fame with names from Othello's cast. Iago Rufu, Othello Kamil, Brabacho Coat, and Cassio Ahmed. The first Othello performance in English presented in Istanbul featured the renowned black American actor Ira Aldridge. He read his lines in English, of course, but the rest of the cast in French. <laughs> Another oddity came in the 1970s when the prominent Turkish director Tunç Elman, who later served for five years as the artistic director of the Milwaukee Repertory Theatre in America and staged two plays on Broadway as well, used two Iagos in his Othello production. Wiley Iago's manipulation of Othello has always fascinated Turkish audiences. Oh, beware, my lord, of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mark the meat it feeds on, that cuckold lives in bliss, who, certain of his fate, loves not his role stronger. But oh, what damned <coughs> minutes tells he o'er, who doubts, yet doubts, suspects, yet strongly loves. But it is probably love and death in Shakespeare that stir us Turks most powerfully. Sonnet 71 tells it all. No longer mourn for me when I am dead. Then you shall hear the surly sullen bell give warning to the world that I am fled from this vile world with vilest worms to dwell. Nay, if you read this line, remember not the hand that writ it. For I love you so, that I, in your sweet thoughts, would be forgot, if thinking on me then should make you woe. Oh, if, I say, you look upon this verse, when I am perhaps compounded with clay, do not so much as my poor name rehearse, but let your love even with my life decay. Lest the wise world should look into your moan, and mock you with me after I am gone. Sublime, but Shakespeare has sometimes viewed love as nonsense, or buffoonery, or madness even. Tis strange, my Theseus, that these lovers speak of, more strange than true. I never may believe these antic fables, nor these fairy toys. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. <laughs> Love is miraculous in Shakespeare's sonnets. Now, sonnet 18, first in English, then in Turkish. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Seni bir yaz güne benzetmek mi? Neydi sen? Çok daha güzelsin sen, çok daha cana yakın. Taze tomurcukları, sert rüzgarlar örseler, kısacıktır süresi yeryüzünde bir yazın. Işıldar göğün gözü yakacak kadar sıcak. 
ve sık sık kararır da yaldız düşer yüzünden her güzel, güzellikten er geç yoksun kalacak kader ya da varlığın bozulması yüzünden ama hiç solmayacak sendeki ölümsüz yaz güzelliğin yitmez ki asla olmaz ki burada gölgesindesin diye ecel caka satamaz sen çağları aşarken bu ölmez satırlarda insanlar nefes alsın gözler görsün el verir yaşadıkça şiirim sana da hayat verir The sonnets are unforgettable. Forgetting reminds me of actors forgetting their lines. Being an actor, uh, Shakespeare must have been aware of that problem. He occasionally mentions it. Like a dull actor now, I have forgot my part, and I am out, even to a full disgrace. As you probably know, there have been innumerable instances of forgetting lines in Shakespeare performances. When John Barrymore was doing Richard III, the actor playing Radcliffe was about to say, My lord, tis I, the early village cock, hath twice done salutation to the morn. But he got stuck after that early village cock. Started again? No use. Once more? Couldn't get it. Again? Barrymore blurted out, Why the hell don't you crow then? <laughs> <laughs> A funny thing happened to Julia Marlowe when she was doing Olivia in Twelfth Night. She turned to the friar and delivered her first line perfectly. Then lead the way, good father, and heavens so shine. But Julia Marlowe drew a blank on the next line. Somehow she came up with a rhyming line of her own in iambic pentameter. <laughs> then lead the way, good father, and heavens so shine. I can't recall another blessed line. <laughs> Actors are an amazing bunch. Edmund <laughs> Cain, who dominated the London stage in the first three decades of the 19th century, was doing Othello. He roughed up Iago mercilessly. After the performance, a friend of his said to Cain, You nearly killed the chap. This is what I call enthusiastic acting. Cain looked at his friend in amazement and said, What are you talking about? I was really trying to kill the chap. He was upstaging me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Audiences too can be amazing. There was a charismatic Turkish author, Cevat Shakir, who used the pen name of the fisherman of Halikarnassus, Oxonian, polyglot, irreverent, eccentric. He was famous also for his Merhaba! Hello! <laughs> He even said hello for goodbye. Once he went to Macbeth, a little tipsy, they seated him in the front row. When he heard, hail Duncan, hail Macduff, hail Macbeth, madhaba Macbeth, he jumped to his feet and gave the cast a big madhaba. <laughs> in the 19th century and the early decades of the 20th, Turkish productions, as elsewhere, were characterized by overacting. After the mid-20th century, our best stage work seemed to be heeding Hamlet's advice. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of your players do, I had as if the town crier spoke my lines. <laughs> Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand thus, but use all gently. For in the very torrent, tempest, and as I may say, the whirlwind of passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Oh, it offends me to the soul to hear a robustious periwig-pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, who, for the most part, are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noise. But be not too tame, neither. But let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action. With this special observance, that you overstep not the modesty of nature. For anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold, as twere, the mirror up to nature. To show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. Now. This overdone, or come tardy off, though it make the unskillful laugh, cannot but make the judicious grieve. 
the censure of the which one must in your allowance o'erweigh a whole theater of others. In the 19th century, there was a prominent Shakespeare actor-director by the name of William Charles McCready. Once in his new Hamlet production, he had a King Claudius whom he found quite inferior. So he decided to keep the man in the rear of the stage, and he instructed Claudius to die at a spot way back on the stage. <coughs> McCready himself was, of course, going to die all the way in front, as close to the audience as possible. Opening night, King Claudius stabbed, came staggering, and fell right into McCready's spot. <laughs> McCready was taken aback and furious. He whispered, what are you doing here? Go back. Die in your own spot. <laughs> <laughs> Claudius, almost dead, straightened up and said to McCready at the top of his voice, Look here, McCready, I did everything you asked me to do at the rehearsals. Now I am the king. I shall die whatever I do. <laughs> at another London performance at the end of Macbeth, something similar occurred. Macduff and Macbeth were at it, brandishing their swords. Although he is supposed to die, Macbeth gave his all, refusing to be defeated, to die. As Macbeth kept, sl kept slinging his sword, poor Macduff nearly collapsed of exhaustion. He kept begging, stop it, cut it short, please die, enough of this now. No use. Macbeth almost managed to emerge victorious, to, to keep alive, to change the end. But a while later, he took pity on Macduff and Shakespeare and died. The audience loved all this. During the sword fight, they clapped rhythmically to encourage Macbeth. Giving him a thunderous applause, they made dead Macbeth rise to his feet and gave him another round of applause. Perhaps the most lyrical work in the history of love tragedies is Romeo and Juliet. Here is Romeo rhapsodizing about Juliet. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief, that thou her maid art far more fair than she. Be not her maid, since she is envious. Her vestal livery is but sick and green, and none but fools do wear it. Cast it off. It is my lady. Oh, it is my love. Oh, that she knew she were. She speaks, yet she says nothing. What of that? Her eye discourses. I will answer it. I am too bold. It is not for me. She speaks. Two of the fairest stars in all the heaven, to twinkle in their spheres till they return. What if her eyes were there? They in her head, the brightness of her cheek, would shame those stars as die daylight doth a lamp. Her eyes in heaven would through the airy region stream so bright that birds would sing and think it were night. See how she leans her cheek upon her hand. Oh, that I were glove upon that hand, that I might touch that cheek. Lady Macbeth, Desdemona, Cleopatra, Portia, Gertrude, Ophelia are among Shakespeare's most memorable protagonists. Catherine the Shrew is truly memorable. Taming her was a formidable task. In Turkey, taming of the shrew was seldom successful, probably because all Turkish girls are angelic, like me. <laughs> there has never been a Turkish shrew, as you all know. The only passage that all Turkish men agree with in Shakespeare is, Thy husband is thy lord, <laughs> thy life, thy keeper, thy head, thy sovereign, one that cares for thee and for thy maintenance commits his body to painful labor both at sea and land, to watch the night in storms, the day in cold, whilst thou liest warm at home, secure and safe, and craves no other tribute at thy hands but love, fair looks, and true obedience. <laughs> Too little payment for so great a debt. <laughs> <laughs>
allow me to tell you an anecdote. Robert College, Istanbul's American College, produced and still produces many plays every year, amateur performances of almost professional caliber. In 1950, they did, and I watched this performance as well, uh, they did Romeo and Juliet in English. A sophomore, who is now arguably Turkey's richest man, had a bit part, first watchman, with very few lines, of course. He was going to enter, see Juliet and Romeo lying dead, and say, oh, what a pitiful sight. He swaggered in and said, oh, what a beautiful sight. <laughs> audience roared with laughter, the entire cast was in guffles, including the dead Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> Perhaps, ladies and gentlemen, no one in the past four centuries has surpassed Shakespeare's sonnet sequence. The universal appeal of the sonnets has taken hold of Turkish poetry lovers as well. When I have seen by time's fell hand defaced the rich proud cost of outburn buried age, when sometime lofty towers I see down raised, and brass eternal slave to mortal rage. When I have seen the hungry ocean gain advantage on the kingdom of the shore, and the firm soil win of the watery main, increasing store with loss, and loss with store. When I have seen such interchange of state, or state itself confounded to decay, ruin hath taught me thus to ruminate, that time will come and take my love away. This thought is as a death which cannot choose, but weep to have that which it fears to lose. Our revels now are ended. These, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Oh, wonder! How many goodly creatures are there here? How beauteous mankind is! Oh, brave new world <coughs> that has such people in it! Wow. <laughs>